Hello everybody, welcome back to another video. Uh, this one's going to be a little bit different because we are finally starting a course on concrete design and reinforced concrete design. And I'm super excited to be covering uh, this material because concrete design is a fundamental subject once you get into the field, as it is one of the most commonly used construction materials because it's super versatile and it's also relatively cheap in contrast to other build building materials. So in this first video, I just wanted to cover the basics of what is involved in concrete design, how to get specific strength parameters of your concrete material, and then using a problem to determine how we usually solve for these in real life. Um, so a good starting point for this video is just to cover the basics of what concrete is, what concrete is good at resisting, so compression or tension, and what material properties are required to solve problems. So I wanted to just start and preface by saying this is also based on Canadian code. However, for your respective region, you can search up all of these parameters uh, inside of your respective codes and determine uh, if formulas are different or if there's different design regulations uh, based on your region. So take this as just a reference. It may be different, it may be the same, but for the most part, the theory talked about in this video is gonna be applicable worldwide, okay? So what is concrete? We could we could start there. Uh, concrete is a material that is comprised of three different ingredients. Those three ingredients are water, cement, and aggregate. And based on that composition or the proportions that you have for each of these materials, the strength is going to vary. So based on this mix that you have designed for, it will vary in strength. Once this mix has hardened, you will be given an artificial rock, which is known as concrete. And the strength properties of this concrete is that it's very strong in compression, but very weak in tension. So if we looked at this problem here, just below, we have a simple beam that's been loaded and it's made of concrete. And once we load it, we're noticing that we're having compression in this top face, but we're also having tension in this bottom face here. And as we are loading this beam, we're developing these cracks in this bottom tensile face. Why is that happening? This is happening because concrete is super weak in tension, but very strong in compression. So as you are stretching out this bottom face, you're developing these cracks. And once these cracks start to develop in an unreinforced concrete, you're going to result in a brittle failure. So in order to prevent this, we need to add a material that is strong in tension to this bottom face. And that material is going to end up being steel reinforcement. And we need to design the quantity and the size of reinforcement on this bottom face in order to resist this tensile force that is being developed while it's being loaded. And if we looked at this a little bit closer, we actually have a comparison that we can make. If we took an equivalent area of concrete and steel, the steel's ability to resist tension is approximately 10 times greater than that of the concrete's ability to resist compression. So you can't just arbitrarily put reinforcement in. The designer has to design a adequate quantity such that you're not over designing or under designing the amount of reinforcement you've put in the member. So in order to do this design of reinforcement, we have to first understand the properties of the concrete material. And one of the most important design variables that we're going to be looking at in concrete design is represent, represented by the specified compressive strength, Fc prime. And generally, this value ranges between 20 MPa and 40 MPa. And since it's represented in MPa, that means it is a stress value. And in simple terms, Fc prime represents the amount of axial compression, axial compression <laughs> force that can be applied over an area of concrete before it fails in compression. And this value is typically derived from testing cylinders. So testing cylinders is a controlled test. You have a mix that's poured on site and you'll cast a couple of these cylinders that have fixed dimensions with a fixed cross-sectional area. You're then going to take these cylinders to a controlled test environment after 28 days, and you're going to test its strength and compression. And to do this, you are applying an axle load to the cylinder until it fails. And when you take this test, 
you can determine what force was applied over the area before it broke, which gives you the compressive strength. An additional point for design purposes, as you load the cylinder, you're going to have an initial length of the cylinder versus a final length, which will give you a strain value at failure. And in design codes, it will limit that strain or that initial to final length as 0 0.0035. Now that we know about the compressive strength, we can also talk about the tensile strength of concrete. Obviously, we just discussed that it's not very strong in uh, tension, but there's still a design uh, or calculation that you can do to figure out what this value would be. And typically, the tensile strength of concrete is 8 to 15% of what the compressive strength is. And for design purposes, if you wanted to determine it, you would determine the uh, modulus of rupture or the tensile uh, stress that it would fail at to be this formula here. So 0 0.6 times lambda times the root of the compressive strength. And this lambda simply represents the density of your concrete and it is a coefficient. So if you had a normal density concrete, your lambda would be one. If you had a low density concrete, it would be reduced to 0 0.75 which makes sense because as you reduce the density of your concrete, you're going to have a lower tensile strength uh, for the material. And since we talked about FC prime already, we know that this tensile strength is going to be based or interpolated on that solved for or uh, tested compressive strength value. And that gives you your final formula for rupture strength. Okay. Lastly, you need to talk about the modulus of elasticity of concrete. And we've already talked about this material property in the past before, but as a recall, the modulus of elasticity is uh, a material property that relates the stress applied to the strain developed in your material. And it defines how your concrete will deform under a given load during the elastic phase. Now this property is useful for calculations uh, related to stiffness and deflection of the concrete member. And it's calculated using this, for this formula down here and here's the code requirement if you wanted to search up in the Canadian code. And it's based on, once again, the compressive strength of your material, but also the unit, uh, the unit weight, which typically ranges between 1500 kilograms per meter cubed, 2500 kilograms per meter cubed. But generally for reinforced concrete, you're gonna be using 2400 kilograms per meter cubed. So now that we've covered all of these design parameters of our concrete mix, we can actually hop into a problem and see how these design parameters can be solved for. Alrighty, so now that we've cleaned up the page, we can hop into the problem. And it is asking us to look at a simply supported unreinforced concrete test beam that spans 2.4 meters and fails under the following load configuration. It says the beam is normal density concrete and to neglect the self weight of the beam. And it's asking us to find the modulus of rupture, the specified compressive strength, and the modulus of elasticity. And we can do this simply by first solving for our shear moment diagrams and then using these values to solve for the design variables asked for. So we know that in this problem, we're gonna have equal reactions on both sides over here and here based on this symmetric equal loading. So this is gonna be three kilonewtons, and this is also going to be three kilonewtons on this side. And our shear diagram will be super simple. We have a jump up of three kilonewtons. That's gonna come all the way across to where this three kilonewtons is coming back down. That's gonna bring us back to zero. Once again, another jump downwards, bringing us back to our support, which jumps back up, bringing everything to equilibrium. So this will be three, and this will be negative three. This is all in kil kilonewtons. Then we can take this area times the length that it covers to determine what the peak will be for our moment diagram. So we're gonna have a rise up and then a flat line since there's no shear load throughout this length. And then it will come right back down to zero. So this will be three times the length, which is 0.8. So three times L over three, which is gonna be 0.8 meters. And that will equal to 2.4. Same on this side. And it's saying that this beam is a test beam that fails under the loading. So in this max moment area is where the failure will occur. So it fails right here. So that means that we have to look at this max moment that's developed in this region to solve for our design variables. And this is known as a two point loading test. And it's good because over this area where it fails, 
there's theoretically no shear being applied at this location. So it's strictly failing under flexure. So now let's go ahead and figure out what we need to do to solve for the variables. We know that the stress formula is simply equal to m y over i, right? And if we interpolate this, we can actually swap out the stress for fr, which is the rupture modulus, correct? And we know that this is the variable that we're trying to solve for because it is failing under flexure, meaning that it's failing in tension. So that max moment that's occurring here will be the max load applied during the tensile failure. Thus, we use it to solve for what that tensile strength was at the given loading. So we're simply plugging in our max moment at that location times our design variables for our specific cross-section. And we're given the cross-section right here. So we can go ahead and start plugging in all of these variables. We have 2.4 times 10 to the 6, and that's going to be in newtons per millimeter. Our y, based on this uh, uniform rectangular cross-section, is going to be right dead in the center of it, so it's half of this height. So that's going to be 150 divided by 2, which is in millimeters. And then that's all over the moment of inertia for this cross-section, based on this xx axis going through the center. So it's going to be base of 100. So 1 over 12, 100 at the base, and then that 150 as the height, all to the power of 3. This will be in millimeters to the fourth. And then solving for that, you're going to be left with a value of approximately 6.4 newtons per millimeter squared, or MPA. Now that's our first design variable solved for. We can now actually rearrange this rupture formula to determine what the compressive uh, specified strength is for the concrete as well. So rearranging that formula would look something like this, where we have Fc prime rearranged for, bring 0.6 in lambda over to the rupture side and squaring everything. So we have Fr over 0.6 times lambda, and that's all squared. Then plugging in our design variable of Fr, we have 6.4 on the top, that's an MPA, 0.6 on the bottom, normal density concrete, meaning that lambda is 1, and that is all squared, meaning that our FC prime is going to equal a crazy value <laughs> of 113.8 MPA. Now these numbers are arbitrary, uh, the normal range for concrete is between 20 to 40 MPA, once again. Uh, but I just set up these numbers kind of uh, on a whim just to kind of keep things simple. Uh, in reality, this is very unlikely, but uh, for the sake of the problem, let's just go along with it. 113.8 MPA uh, for a specified compressive strength. Now, lastly, it's asking us to determine the modulus plasticity. So we're simply going to be plugging in our design variables once again into this formula where we have 3300. Uh, times the root of the compressive strength, so 113.8 plus 690, or 6,900. And then for a uh, unreinforced beam, that unit weight is going to be around 1,700, but once again, these numbers are pretty arbitrary. And then we plug that last number in to give us a final solve value of 26,000. 755 MPA. Now, once again, numbers are super arbitrary, but uh, I hope this helps to understand where these values are coming from, why they're useful, and what each of these values mean for future reinforced uh, design problems. So in our next video, we're going to be talking a bit more about designing reinforced members, uh, but this is definitely a good starting point for understanding where variables are coming from. Okay, so I hope this helped. Thanks for watching.